Are you preparing to write a paper? Do you get anxious not knowing what the outcome is going to be of this long process? Today I'm sharing with you my conversation with Anna Clemens, whose specialty is to coach researchers on how to write for journal articles. If writing articles is daunting for you, if you don't think your English is good enough, if you don't feel like you have a system that you can repeat again and again, this episode is for you. During our conversation, Anna talked about how to systematize article writing. She talked about the importance of how to communicate with editors and also about different ways we sabotage ourselves when setting out to write a paper. There is a lot of actionable advice in this episode, so I suggest you listen, you re-listen and you take notes. No matter what stage you're at in your research journey, I am convinced that this conversation with Anna is going to have multiple take-home messages for you that will improve your experience writing journal papers. And now, without further ado, my conversation with Anna Clements. Welcome to this week's episode of Papa PhD. This week, I have the great pleasure of having with me Anna Clements. Uh, Dr. Anna Clements is an academic writing coach with a PhD in chemistry. In her online program, the Researchers Writing Academy, Anna helps researchers get their papers published in their target journals without procrastinating on the writing. Oh, procrastination, Anna. <laughs> Isn't that a, a bane for a lot of us? <laughs> Trigger something, right? <laughs> yes. Inside and outside yeah. of academia. <laughs> right. Welcome on the yeah, show. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's funny because the thing about procrastination is really the thing that when people approach me and they tell me what they struggle with when it comes to writing papers, that's like the number one thing they say. <laughs> Getting started on those uh, in front of that blank page, it is. Exactly. I know I live. I live that, uh, it, and it's. Uh, there are ways to to kind of circumvent it, and I think we might talk about some of them today. I'm sure we will. But uh, yeah, it's sometimes our brain plays tricks on us. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> <laughs> so a PhD in chemistry and now coach for writing for uh, researchers. Can you? Share a little bit more on how that transpired, that transition. Yeah, sure. It was um, it was kind of a very uh, long-winded transition. So it wasn't like a direct thing. It wasn't like the first thing I did after graduating with my PhD. Um, instead, I graduated, and honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, and I, what I did and what I can recommend everyone to do <laughs> um, when you are kind of finishing something and you're not quite sure where to go next if that's your thing um, and you have you know the means to do that to take some time off that's what I did um, lift off my savings a little bit mm -hmm. um, and just you know did a lot of like introversion and reflection and trying to understand what I wanted to do and one thing that was became clear to me was that writing so a question I asked myself was which parts of my PhD did I enjoy because there were a lot of things I didn't enjoy mm -hmm. um, but there were also parts that I really really liked um, and then it became really I mean it was like an easy question for me because it was like writing yeah that was fun that was like you know things I had some supervision problems um, some like a lot of conflict a lot of like problems with my like yeah with, with my supervision essentially my mm -hmm. other colleagues were all fine um but then what was really remarkable to me that when I was doing my PhD I felt like <laughs> or I noticed that um writing was something very positive to me like writing kind of became a refuge where um I guess I was kind of good at it mm -hmm. and I don't really know why exactly because it's not like I'd like written like poetry as a child or anything <laughs> like that. I mean, I was always like into reading books and language and stuff, but I'd not done much writing, but it kind of came easy to me um, and I really loved it. I love writing my thesis, you know, my PhD thesis. I love writing papers. And I, I also noticed like everyone around me, all the other PhD students were like, oh my God, like, <laughs> how do you like this like for them it was like the worst part <laughs> of the PhD and for me it was like um 
the best part. So anyway, this was a very long introduction to this. But then I basically started to do jobs like freelance jobs that had to do with writing and science, ventured a bit in science journalism, um, okay. because this was seemed to me like the obvious thing. Yeah. Like if you like science and writing, you become like a science writer, right? Yeah. Um, like write for newspapers, magazines, things like that. And I did that. Um, I did that, but um, it wasn't really it. Mm -hmm. um, and it also something to do with a job situation around that. It's just, I, I mean, I love, I adore writing, uh, science writing. So like writing for Popular Science Magazine, I did that a lot, like writing um, about like scientific discoveries, about like topics, mm -hmm. like this one article I wrote about aphantasia, um, which is a condition when you don't have a mind's eye. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very, very common, um, but it's not talked about a lot. So this article, I mean, this is so amazing because still people like get in touch with me because of that okay. article. It was published. So I wrote it in German for the German version of Scientific American and okay. then Scientific American translated it. So this is why it's kind of like, you know, out there and like easy to find when you Google aphantasia. So this is like, I mean, this is just an example of why I, it was so fun. Mm -hmm. Like, and it is fun because you really like you talk to people about interesting things. Mm -hmm. you know? um, yeah, I see. I feel like when I'm talking about it, like there's definitely a passion there. But the job market isn't as such as that. It's very easy to survive, honestly, mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're doing freelance science writing. I mean, basically, never met anyone who isn't like super super established. Like if you've been doing this for fifty years, then you then will you be able to. Yeah. But, like, if you're a new one, like, basically everyone I know who does it, they also do other jobs that aren't as much fun, you know? Just And these are the jobs that bring the income. Like, they write press releases for universities, things like yeah. that, you know? <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't want to do this. And then I kind of transitioned into editing. Um, so I would edit um, people's papers, uh, like mm. academic papers. And that transitioned into me coaching so I kind of realized that editing is, um, it was kind of too late. And the way I edit was very, very thorough. So I wouldn't just like correct the language, things like that, or grammar. It was like, okay, so so what do you want to tell? Like what, what, what do you want to tell people in this paper? Like what is like the key thing you want to convey? And I would really spend time like getting the story right and mm -hmm. things like that. So it was just like a type of editing that, it's actually very hard to, you know, it, it. I felt like it was too late, like too late in the process because when the researchers had already written, mm -hmm. like, you know, they'd already spent months, sometimes a year, sometimes several years to, to, to um, write that draft. And then I come and I'm like, yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. let's, <laughs> let's rework like it. completely yeah. redo it. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was kind of, I mean, people were, you know, they were happy because, like, you know, the articles often were very successful then, but it's not very efficient and it's kind of frustrating. And, you know, and then I realized, okay, I need to do this the other way around. Like, and nobody, I didn't really see anyone doing this, but really teaching researchers how to write a paper step by step. So like working with them. Okay. Now you have your data. Okay. What do we do first? What do we do then? Like all the steps to like have it in a really, um, yeah, in a, you know, to, to have like a really compelling article mm -hmm. yeah Jen just said developmental editing yeah and that's the funny thing yeah. because um it is best early in the process but um it's often not done early in the process it's, i mean not in the academic world or not in the academic paper writing world at least like, like many things like i you know on the podcast we talk about uh careers a lot and career preparation career readiness and of course it's much better early on but you know do people have time or do people feel that they have time to focus on those things there's always stuff on top of the list and researchers as we know have a lot of stuff and admin and this and that and you know unless they're really keen on becoming really great writers they're not going to be you know take the time to get training on that or at least they they won't think about it and and i guess that's where you come in right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i think people realize they need training um i mean this is what i see from my program 
um, because the biggest kind of group of people that are in the program are system professors or like new principal investigators. So people who are then like they made it through the PhD, they maybe did a postdoc or two or something like that. And then they were like, okay, they got the opportunity to have their own group, their own lab. Um, and then they don't have a PI anymore, <laughs> who either with their name or with their expertise or I don't know, with their, you know, yeah, whatever kind of skills that person had is it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and they suddenly have to <laughs> publish on their own and they have to, you know, think about, okay, how am I going to teach writing to those PhD students <laughs> uh, or master students or whatever students or postdocs or whoever's in their group? Um, and, and then they're like, oh, <laughs> I don't actually know how to do that. <laughs> And and so this is the stage at which they uh, usually come to you and uh, and 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 try and ask you about about the training. Uh, and so you, the the interesting thing for me uh, always is the journey. What you know, and and in, in this case, I'm still thinking of you as a as a PhD now becoming a coach for writing. I think the 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 journey is is kind of uh, straightforward in a way but there's there's a part of it that I, that I feel is unknown to a lot of people even yesterday i was taking part in a conversation uh, about you know breaking into medical writing and mm -hmm. um the 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 thing uh, about what you said is you mentioned starting writing for journals for for uh, uh i don't know uh, newspapers or or magazines uh, do you think we can spend a minute or two uh just sharing with people how they can start writing even if they're still you know doing their phd what are mm -hmm. what are what are ways they can start you know getting other exp other writing experience Uh, that will mm -hmm. then serve them later on for when they get to this stage that you just mentioned. Is this something you can talk about? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I'm just like thinking back to what I did uh, and how I got this experience because of course, like the problem is always you don't get gigs without experience, but how do you get exactly. experience the without getting the egg. gigs? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that has helped me actually, I've read a book which was called, oh gosh, I can't remember, but it was basically how to get published, like how to get commissioned without experience. Mm -hmm. So this was written by a journalist who's like a freelance journalist okay. who um, talks through, okay, what's the pitching process like? Um, and talks through how you can kind of, You know, you're not lying, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you're not necessarily mentioning it that you don't have, that you aren't published, mm -hmm. you know, because in the end, the editors that work at like, let's say a magazine, they're like really busy. And what they're interesting, eh, interested in is a good story. Like they want to, so I also, I did an internship with this German version of Scientific American. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I learned there, like, I mean, this is a very good thing to do as well. Um, it's a bit more time consuming. You know, I would only do this if, you, if you're serious about it. I did it for six months, you know, okay. like, <laughs> um, so it was a commitment. Uh, but of course you learn a ton, like, because you learn how it's working on the inside. Um, and you, you know, okay, they're meeting once a week, <laughs> the editors, and they are discussing, everyone is kind of presenting the emails they got, the pictures they got. And what they're interested in is like a new idea, like something that the journal either hasn't published in a long time or like an angle to a topic that they haven't had in there, just something or something they just you know, haven't thought about because of course you have like an editorial team. It's like, I mean, in that case, it was like, I don't know, maybe 10 people or something. So there's a lot of brains, you know, and they're exposed to a lot of things, mm -hmm. but still, you, I mean, kind of your way in is to kind of think of a thing that they don't think about, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the story, mm -hmm, the story is important. Exactly. Yeah. Like finding something like a nugget, um, And then you basically write a pitch and they're not necessarily asking you to provide references. You know, I think if you have a really good pitch, um, then they might take a punt, you know, and they may okay. not pay you very much at the beginning. 
Um, but that's okay, you know, mm-hmm. for you because you just want the reference, basically. Of course, of course. Um, and you, I would also go like, don't go to like Scientific American, you know, like <laughs> start start somewhere small, start somewhere like, um, I mean, maybe your university actually has a, and lots of universities do have like magazines or publications, yep. and ask them, oh, can I write for you, like. Is there, is there like, just like look around you and see what's like easy. And in the beginning, I mean, I would say don't worry about getting paid. I mean, and later on, do very much worry about that. Yes. But in the very beginning, when you just want a few references, don't worry about it. Do it for free if it has to be, um, just to get the experience, just for you to understand, do I even like doing this? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. No, it totally makes sense. Awesome. I, I, Totally agree with everything you said, and and uh, the university way, especially if you're still in graduate school and you'll you'll do it as a side thing. Uh, it's a good way to go. Uh, it's close at hand. They'll be happy to have someone contributing. Of course, mm-hmm. the payment is not going to be, uh, I think, on the table there. But your, the experience uh, will be there. And and there's you know there's really good university publications and student publications that that might be interesting. Mm-hmm. Or uh, you know one thing I'm thinking is uh, if you work in a specific uh, domain or subject, if there's an association uh, or a student association in that subject, for sure mm-hmm. these people will also be interested in your in your co- collaboration. Awesome! This is great because I think often. People, yes, writing is part of what we do uh, uh, as as researchers, as, as young researchers. Uh, but um, it's it's just something we do. It's not something we we get, have the time to work on and make it a you know mm-hmm. make it a skill. Unless someone you know comes in like you and and brings that uh, point of view and that training. Now, for for so you were mentioning uh, like early career researchers needing to now be the one who writes and the, the one who mm-hmm. writes well and the one who maybe edits what's coming from uh, from their their lab members uh mm-hmm. what would you say is uh, a challenge that commonly you know that you see people coming uh coming with or or let's or either a challenge or a blind spot or you know something that mm-hmm. they haven't thought of and that when you start your training they go ah oh, okay so from now on I'll do it like this yeah, there's actually there's two things, and they're also kind of related. Um, one thing is, so what what people like, you know, new PIs, um, new assistant professors, quickly often realize is they can't get published in the journal they want to get published in. They get rejected. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that's one thing. The second thing is um, writing is taking them incredibly long, mm-hmm. and the process of getting the paper to the submission stage is really frustrating to them and partly and there's like different kind of things that come up um for example things that come up are they get drafts from phd students and they have to completely rewrite them because they are not at all what they were thinking mm-hmm. um they should be like um or like yeah, the main thing is, or the main blind spot is, they have never thought about what is our process, like as a lab, as a team, as a group, what's our process to to, to write that paper together? Because, mm. of course, like in science, we don't write papers on our own, but we um, we are like, I don't know, two, three, four, five, six, seven yes, <laughs> people who you. kind of, you know, contribute and if you don't think about what the process is, this is going to be a very, very, very <laughs> draining and annoying, time-consuming, um, kind of time-consuming thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Especially like you said, if there's different people contributing, just getting all the communications and everyone looking at or bringing their section, and then uh, work, you know, making it as a, a, a thing that has sense and that has a voice. That you know, it, I I can see how that can be mm-hmm. a problem, and so you you start helping them with that, with making it a process that's repeatable. Is that is that what I'm? Am I understanding well? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So what I do, um, what I teach is is basically 
um, yeah, the whole process, it's like, okay, now you have your data. <laughs> um, you like, I don't know, these are your findings. These are your results. Um, and I like I put a lot of emphasis on first thinking through what the story should be like. Um, so like breaking down, basically deciding, okay, which data, because they're usually like huge amounts of data, you know, loads <laughs> of findings and kind of thinking through, okay, what's our argument actually? Um, like how, like, <laughs> um, like what's our main message is always something we define like then that's the main message. Okay, so what's the like, logical order of presenting our findings mm -hmm. so that we are communicating that main message to the reader? And the aim of this is so that the like resulting paper is like super cohesive. So it's super coherent. Um, we're always like we are not starting, <laughs> like we're not teasing one story in the abstract. And then we are not fulfilling that promise in the article because we're telling a totally different story, which you see, you know, if you read the literature, you see that happening. But what we want to do is like, we want to have this like clear storyline throughout the whole thing. And I think for that to happen and for that to happen, like efficiently, it's really like, okay, let's decide. Like I call it key story elements. Let's decide on the key story elements. Um, and let's decide with the whole group. Like basically, yeah, I teach a lot of aspects of the process. I mean, part is also decide on one person who's going to be in charge of the mm -hmm. process. It's mm -hmm. probably the first author, you know, or the last author, but someone who gets some credit because it's going to be work, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but who kind of maybe does the initial drafts, the initial key story elements, but then like get together with a group, agree on things before you actually start writing. Like that's, I guess, the big takeaway is like don't have – like not yourself or PhD students sit down and just write the paper without having agreed on, okay, what's the storybook going to be? What's the argument going to be? Like make a storyboard, uh, make outlines, like make outlines for sections. Like that's kind of the next step after the story is agreed upon. Um, okay, now think through, okay, which subsections do we want in the mm -hmm. results section? Which paragraphs do we want in the introduction section? Like I would go really granular <laughs> um, and decide on that because then you you avoid so much writing because as soon as you let someone write, <laughs> yourself or someone else, they are going to sit there um, and perfect each sentence, you know? They're going <laughs> to write. They're not going to be happy with it. They're going to perfect, perfect it. <laughs> yeah. They're going to honestly waste time and maybe then later you decide oh but we didn't even need to mention this information mm -hmm. <laughs> that you or that person then just spent i don't know half an hour perfecting mm -hmm. so um that's why i think yeah the, the like planning before you actually you know write i think is this is very is like what i teach it's a very interesting uh, structure or, or process you're describing because in the beginning, you know, we were talking about procrastination and and uh, and the white page, you know, and and mm -hmm. and <clears throat> uh, this way, like so, doing it this way, creating like sounds to me like you know, creating buckets for the things that are the text that is going to come later on. I think is already a great way to prevent this. Uh, this uh, writer's block and and this procrastination mm -hmm. because you don't know where to start and how to perfect that sentence like like you were saying uh, it's it's a really really great approach uh, and it's uh, very much at attractive to me it's kind of a design thing you design the the mm -hmm. the the article before filling in the actual uh, the actual buckets uh, and and once people do that and this of course is going to have the flavor of the person uh, that especially the one mm -hmm. that is in charge of the of the article but then i imagine it also helps collaborators a lot because there's like i said there's buckets in there for them to fill instead of okay think about what you want to write and then they come with three pages and then we need to sift through those pages and and say okay this paragraph yes this no um yeah it sounds yeah yeah exactly i mean this is really a huge part of it like um what people have, like the feedback I've gotten was like, um, like from people who have gone through the researchers writing academy, they were like, I'm so much more confident now to like guide my co-authors through the process. And actually, like they have confidence, like one person said, Katya, uh, we have like a case study of on my website as well. She said, um, like, I could just tell them 
oh no, this is maybe for another article, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I think now we are like sidetracking because look, we agreed on this. <laughs> <laughs> and now you suggested this. And then people, like which like in her experience, her experience was that her co-authors went, oh yeah, you're right. Like thanks. Like, you know, like people were actually thankful to be You know, taken by the hand a little bit, there was someone there who who could guide the ship, who would keep everyone on track and to have that like a uh, very clear path mm -hmm. ahead of them. And it makes the relationship with co-authors so much easier, mm -hmm. um, especially, I think, if you talk about it before, like if you just lay it out beforehand and be like, okay, let's, let, you know, I'm in charge <laughs> or I'm the first or last author or whatever. Uh, or the owner of the project or however, you know, whatever your role is. And you say, I suggest we do it this way. And I mean, people are usually fine with it because truth to be told, not many people have, like not many researchers have a good process for writing papers. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like you're clashing against something usually because <laughs> everyone is just kind of doing it the way they've always kind of done it. Or mm -hmm. like, you know, like, so it's super, super helpful being able to like guide that yeah. process with your co-authors. No, and, and if you're starting, I can imagine, you know, the panic of, you know, a sculptor that's starting with a huge block of marble in front of them and having a system and having a framework changes it completely and makes it a much, mm -hmm. a much uh, less daunting process to start because there's like, there's a pro, less, like, well, it's in, I just said it, but there's a process to follow. Uh, I, I really, really like um We like that approach. Papa PhD is supported by Noted Source, the platform connecting academic researchers to companies for project-based opportunities across disciplines, from sciences to arts and humanities. Top corporate innovation teams work with academia, but the smartest ones use Noted Source to discover and collaborate with experts like you. Easily sign up today at papaphd.com forward slash Nordic source. Using Google Scholar and Orchid Imports, it only takes a few minutes to create a professional profile that lets clients know you're open to collaboration. Nordic source handles the bureaucracy so you can focus on what you know best. That's papaphd.com forward slash Nordic source. Before going back to my conversation with my guest Anna Clemens about article writing, I have a little favor to ask of you. I'm planning improvements to the show, and getting to know you better will allow me to tailor those improvements to your preferences and to your needs. So please visit papaphd.com forward slash audience and fill in the audience survey that's there for you. Thank you for your help and for your time. Now, one, one thing I'm, I'm thinking, because here we are, we've been talking about the point of view of the team, of the, the, the author of the, the PI, um, mm -hmm. and I, I'm really curious uh, about, because you've mentioned that, um, you know, people going through, tr through this training then have success getting, uh, getting their articles published. How does this, you know, upstream work then uh, affect... Uh, What happens when reviewer number one, reviewer number two get the draft? Uh, what are these people looking for that the system helps them, helps researchers actually give them what they're what the reviewers are looking for? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's such a good question. Um, so I kind of frame it in like two stages because the first stage is actually the journal editor mm -hmm. um, because we first have to pass them. So they send it even out to peer review. So it's kind of, um, and I would say when it comes to writing, um, yeah, I mean, I would, yeah, I would, it's like a two stage thing. So shall I, shall I talk about the journal editor thing Go as ahead. well? Yes, yes, sure. That stage, because it's, it's very important um, because So the general editor, what's very important there is you, like what they look at is the abstract, um, your figures. I mean, it depends on the journal and the editor. Of course, I'm generalizing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But their title, cover letter, abstract, figures um, are they like the main things because they want to understand, okay, is this relevant for our journal, for our readership? Um, and 
if it is, is it relevant and is significant? Like, is it like novel um, enough, you know, for, for whatever, like the journal targets at, you know, like different journals have different kind of, um, uh, you know, want a different visions and yeah, exactly level of significance. Um, and then they look at, okay, do the, do I believe the results? Like, does it make mm. sense to me? Um, or like or what I said earlier, or is the author promising or the author team promising something in the abstract they can't deliver on? So that's why typically they look at the figures, but they're often not subject matter experts, so they won't be able to like f- fully understand. Critically, okay, okay. So, but, so the most important thing there is um, make it possible for your editor to actually um, follow your argument in the figures like have figures because they likely won't read the text because mm-hmm. they're not a subject matter expert and they expect this to be too difficult. I mean, some will, you know, this is generalizing. And this is actually, <laughs> I've talked to a lot of journal editors and I'm always like <laughs> um, trying to find this information from them. So this is um, basically relaying things that they have told me. I'm mm-hmm. not like making this up. Um, and figures are like very, very important okay. there. And they want to see the argument in the figures. And you also can, like, then you can do subsections. You know, you can really, like, try to communicate your research, but also, and this is as important, the story. You know, like, in your story, it becomes clear how significant your research is um, and whether it is suitable for that journal. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can do that in the abstract. You kind of do it in the whole paper, but the abstract, I would recommend, tell a mini story, like tell your story, like a synopsis of your story in the abstract, tell the full thing, tell people why it's significant, tell tell them what problem you're solving. Um, And also in the cover letter. So the cover letter is, that is so powerful. And um, a lot of journal editors have told me that like authors are sometimes, you know, wasting that space a little bit by just like, copy pasting an abstract um because they don't need anything that's all like they have the abstract already they're kind of thinking oh like now you can talk to me like directly like you're not talking to me through something you're going to put out into the public but this is like our private channel so be very direct with me um tell me like maybe there's something that you couldn't mention you know in the introduction like maybe you're super critical of some work that's out there and you don't necessarily you know, want to create enemies. Um, so you're not putting this in the introduction section, but this is like perfect if that's the case. Like tell the editor, tell them like, I mean, give them reasons, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, for why that is the case. Um, Talking to them one-on-one, really... like from person exactly. to person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and sell, you know. I spoke to an editor at a conference last summer and he was like, you know, it's really weird to me how few people sell. <laughs> I uh, try to sell their article in the cover letter because that's what it's for. Like, this is your 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 place to sell your article, and mm-hmm. and if you don't, you know, they may get suspicious because they're like, oh, you don't believe in it, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I mean, like, you have to think about how how it is for them and what expectations they have. So that's the editor um, stage, um, and then the peer review stage. They're the most important thing that you can do in your article when it comes to writing, because of course, most of what the peer reviewers are looking at is the actual science, which I can't help with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have to, uh, you have to do this on your own. Um, that your data is, you know, good, reliable, robust, solid. They're checking that you check for all parameters, you know, or for the relevant parameters, or I mean, enough parameters so that it's, um, relevant for the journal you know a higher impact factor journal will probably want you to have a very big study you know like nature or something science yeah, yeah. there was like huge study huge data sets they want you to have thought about every eventuality that could kind of topple your <laughs> conclusion mm-hmm. um so they want it to be very robust um and they maybe want to have the next step like if you have um uh, if you have like a proof of concept study, they want to already see, oh, have you tried to implement, like apply it? <laughs> so like you have to think like that, but that's like the very like uh, big journals. And um, 
where was I going with this? Well, so the peer reviewers, yeah, they look at um, like, is your study robust, solid? And when it comes to writing, what you can do, like what writing can achieve there for you is not to be misunderstood. So write clearly because honestly, like I feel like a lot of peer review, like (laughs) a lot of space in peer review reports is kind of about, (laughs) oh, they misunderstood, you know, they misunderstood what you were saying. And I, I don't know if you've written like those of you watching or listening to this, if you've written a paper and got a peer review report back, you may have had this. I mean, I feel like we all, all had this. Yeah, I remember hearing like, this. Yeah. yeah, but that's not what I mean. Yeah. Like they totally <laughs> misunderstood me. Like how could they? But honestly, it's on you. Like if they misunderstood you, mm-hmm. it's probably on you because it's your, like if they misunderstood, they are just a reader, right? Your, the other readers will also under, misunderstand. So it's very good to get this flagged by them. Um, and this is where really clear writing, like this is like my one number one thing when it comes to like, like we talked a lot about the process and structuring a paper. Mm-hmm. When it comes to the actual like writing, be clear, like be super, super clear. Like this is, I think, n- number one priority if you write. Like I... <laughs> So many um, researchers think they have to like sound like an expert. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> a lot of like non-native English speakers, like people who don't have English as their first language, think they, you know, their English isn't adequate. But where I think, you know, probably your English is fine because you know you do a PhD or you do research in English mm. um, if you do. Um, and you know you will be fine like if you can discuss your research with your group with your department or go to a conference present your research you have enough English to write an article Mm -hmm. you know that's kind of what I mean and then I think we kind of overestimate how good we have to be in English to write an article where I really think like the main like don't overthink your English like um, but think about being clear like, mm-hmm. um, like I think this is like the, should be the goal. Of, or I, I mean, it's, I think the most effective way to get articles published is to think about being clear and mm-hmm. make that a priority, not like being grammatically correct a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> yeah. Thinking about commas and stuff. I mean, yeah, sometimes they can maybe change the meaning of it, but honestly, like people make such a big deal out of the Oxford comma and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Like, Whatever. I mean, yeah, maybe like, but it's not what's mm-hmm. gonna like you know get your article rejected. <laughs> that's, that's super interesting. So it means style. You know, you won't be rejected because of style or grammar. That's what I'm hearing, and it's important. Me myself, being someone who has not who does not have English as as their first language, I if, I'm super thankful that you mentioned this because I have again talked with with young researchers, and it is an issue. There's a lot of I can yeah, it's let's say imposter feelings in a way of oh I can't write as well as my PI as well as my benchmate who was born in this this or that country and speaks the language, and uh, super super happy that you mentioned that. Now in these last few minutes you said a bunch of things that uh, that uh, elicited things. Uh, <laughs> I things, took a lot, sorry. <laughs> things for me. No, it's fine. I'll I'll try to uh, to and, and we're we're I mean, we're at at, at forty ish minutes uh, mm-hmm. of of interview. Uh, so we still have a few minutes left, but one of the things that that you mentioned um, that was interesting and 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 uh, that I think people should take note is when you are communicating with this uh, general editor, mm-hmm. you are n- not communicating with an academic. It's someone who is working for a business, and you said something that I think often is not a bad word, but anyway. It can I know be which one you're better. referring to. <laughs> no, sell, sell your article. You said that. Mm-hmm. And I, I do think, you know, if you're listening and this kind of give you a chills hearing this, try mm-hmm. to accept it in a way and say, in this specific uh, uh, fr- uh, framework of communicating with this person who is kind of a, a, a gatekeeper of does this article, article go to the next step or not, I need to, if if it's not you, if you're not able to have this conversation in a less academic and more selly <laughs> marketing way, maybe someone in your lab will. But I think it's important to 
develop a relationship with these people where you can have a relaxed conversation and just and just talk like kind of popularizing what the article is about in a way do you do you agree with the, with this mm -hmm. this is kind of what i got from what you said and it's the first time i hear about it and that's why i kind of put a note to to talk about it <laughs> yeah i love that you picked uh, up on that um because you are you're right like sell selling is the dirty word in academia and <laughs> I, if if like it makes you cringe like those of you who listen then um i mean I had to rethink, I mean, running my own business, I had to think about selling, you know, I had to really examine my relationship with selling uh, because of that. And um, because I come from academia as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I, um, I have been there. I know um, how like selling um, capitalism, things like that are frowned upon. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, you know, I do agree. I do agree about, I hate like bad salesmanship. But selling can also be good, you know, selling, selling is not inherently bad. That's what I want to mm -hmm. say, because if you think about you have a problem, right? And you, um, I don't know, let's say you go to the pharmacy of a skin problem um, and you tell them about your problem and they give you a really good product that solves your skin, I don't know, eczema or whatever. You're like super happy. I mean, mm -hmm. you're so glad that person like, yeah. Yeah. told you about uh, that it will help your problem. And uh, you walk away, you use the product, your skin goes better. You're like, wow. I mean, this is selling, you know, like mm -hmm. selling isn't only sleazy and bad. Like <laughs> just think about, I mean, selling us basically. Um, and I mean, I don't talk about selling much, actually. I talk way more about storytelling, but lots of people don't like storytelling because they think it's too much, it's too salesy. And because storytelling is like, oh, it means like, oh, you're like exaggerating your findings. Yeah. You're like overstating them. And there are there are some examples, you know, there are papers uh, out there, of course, and there are groups that do a lot of papers that are kind of really, you know, blown much. up like mm -hmm. exact and you go like what well, but the results actually don't deliver what you like said at the top and mm. this is gross and this is but i feel like this is not the fault of selling and this is not the fault of storytelling but this is the fault of using it the wrong way you know using the tool the wrong way like there is a way of using the tool the right way and this is we really try to think about where your readers at like Well, I always say it's like put yourself in your reader, in your reader's shoes. Mm -hmm. Think about where they're at. Like the journal editors, you say they're not an academic, or they they probably did like a PhD, postdoc, um, but they're not in academia anymore. They, I mean, look up like the journal editor you're submitting to. Look up what field they're covering, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and just get it. Like get it. Like think about okay, how many research topics do they need to be able to judge mm -hmm. right like they won't have in-depth knowledge um the same as your peer reviewers or as your like direct colleagues so just thinking about that and trying to like pitch it at a level that they will be able to understand the significance and actually often it is that we ourselves as the author haven't really thought about the significance you know mm. not in that specific way so it's also a way, actually, I, I, I mean, I see this happen all the time, that thinking about what story you are telling helps you as the author to actually, um, to actually realize where, like, what potential impact your research could have. Mm -hmm. Because we often don't. Like, we are so, especially if you're a PhD student, uh, you, you probably struggle with this a little more because you're so close to your research and you haven't maybe haven't read mm. <laughs> all the literature surrounding, you know, that maybe your PI has um, or someone who has been, in, you know, working on that topic for a longer time. So, yeah, yeah. I, I suggest just re-examine, just challenge if you feel like selling is a bad thing. Just just think about it a little bit. Try to challenge that thought a little bit. Yeah. Jen says, and it's it's interesting. Selling is like inviting people to your party. If you don't, nobody will come. And and it's true. Yeah. You just if you do it according to your values and to your you know your core, uh, yeah, values and and in life, it'll be fine. Uh, it's just it's just that actually in that space, in the academic space, it has a some things have a bad ring to them. It's like one one thing that I've 
try to find a, a new expression for his personal branding because it's not uh -huh. accepted very well. Uh, and uh, but any, in any case, this is off topic. Um, I, I think this is this is really interesting, and I think just picking up on what you said, doing this work of doing a little bit of storytelling and selling of the story of your research will also for sure have impacts on talking with stakeholders who might be funding you later on, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think there's only positives to that. Now, the other thing I picked up on that I found really, really interesting, it has to do with the, with the peer, uh, peer reviewers. And mm -hmm. you said, you know, it's on you to be clear. And I do remember also that w with that reaction of, oh, they didn't understand what, you know, they, you know, they, they didn't mm -hmm. understand what I wrote. There's some frustration there that, that I remember seeing people getting And I wonder, uh, you know, I feel that getting frustrated is not the useful reaction. So like you said, these uh, comments that might sound like, ah, oh, they're, they're, they don't, you know, they're not, they don't know enough in, on the topic and they, they, don't get it. <laughs> they don't get it is, is kind of stopping you from actually looking at what you wrote and making it better. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is this, is, I, I feel that's what you were saying. I was just mm -hmm. wanting to make a point of, of reinforcing mm -hmm. it. Because emotions can get in the way of you getting a better product at the end. And again, I said product, mm -hmm. it's also a term that's not. <laughs> <laughs> I said product as well, because, yeah, it's, I mean, anyway, yeah, you're right. I mean, it really is like that. It's actually in, um, you know, in journalism, there's uh, a saying that is called kill your darlings. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes we are very in love with our own, like, we have like a sentence or turn of phrase we really like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> It happens to me all the time when I'm right. I'm like, I love this sentence. And then you, but when you reread it or when you get feedback and you feel like, okay, it doesn't go. Like it's always the ones you like the most that unfortunately they don't help, you know, they don't help you get the flow you want. They don't help you. I mean, they may be breaking the flow. They may make it unclear or there's like a better way of putting it. Like, yeah, don't be too attached to what you have written <laughs> um, and do get feedback. I mean, it is really a process and it is a skill. So it's a skill you need to do. Like to develop a skill, you first need to know how to do it and then you need to practice it, right? Like mm -hmm. even if someone tells you this is how you do it, I mean, I, I always think it's better if you have someone who tells you how to do it because then you kind of have a shortcut. Um, but then once you know kind of the system or the strategies, then practice it and get feedback. Like have people, have other people read it, like have your lab mate read it, have, I mean, your supervisor, whoever like read it and ask them, okay, is this clear? Like, did you follow this? Mm -hmm. um, or is there any confusion? I, I mean, I always think it's good to have someone read it who isn't super, like who doesn't know so much about your mm -hmm. study. So You have like a bit of an outside perspective and you don't need to give them your whole article. Just mm -hmm. if you have like points where you aren't sure or something, um, you can kind of prevent, you know, getting that feedback from the peer reviewers if you do that. Yeah. And, uh, and now I, I wonder whether part of, of your training, actually, before I do that, I, I do want to, sh you know, first, thank you for being here so much. And I, I want to share, I want you to be able to share where people can find you. Yes. Um, so you can find me on anaclemens.com and this is A-N-N-A-C-L-E-M-E-N-S.com. And you can find my food training there as well. If you just, you know, there's a big button at the top that says free training. So you can uh, find it that way. Or you had to papaphd.com slash anaclemens. So that's just my name. And if you want to connect on Twitter, um, I'm at scientists, right? And you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Just type in my name, Anna Clemens, comma PhD, I believe. Um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Now we, we're really, really finishing, but as we are talking about this question of how to take in comments from reviewers, uh, especially reviewer number two. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, I, I, I wonder whether, uh, to finish if, whether there's part of your training that focuses just on that, on, you know, how to make the best experience out of getting reviews and then addressing them. And, uh, <clears throat> I know in, in my, in the domain that I was in, and I mentioned in, in yours too, 
sometimes there's experiments, you know, there's the stuff that needs to be done that is not just to do with writing, but I wonder mm -hmm. whether this, for the, for the, for the end, whether there's something that you usually share or recommend that you can, that you can share with the listeners of Papa PhD to do with this thing of the, of the reviews. Yeah, so I think when it comes to peer reviews, as you say, a lot are to do, like a lot of things they point out are to do with the actual like results and experiments. Um, when it comes to writing, I think what's important is always mm -hmm. to be polite, <laughs> be super polite and in your answers, you know, in your reply, um, and be thorough, like, And organize it well so that the editor, because it's usually the editor who sees those replies. It's not actually the peer reviewers. Only if the editor decides to send it out for second round of review, which some journals do, but honestly, a lot of, mm -hmm. especially like mid-tier journals, don't do that. Um, so again, <laughs> in your reply okay. to the peer reviewers, you're kind of talking to the editor again. Um, so think about that. Um, so for example... If reviewer number two misunderstood you, don't just say, oh, they misunderstood me. Or what I meant was X, Y, Z. Now, you have to go back then into the article and change that and then say in your response, I believe that there was a misunderstanding because my writing wasn't clear. Um, we have, or because our writing wasn't clear, we have rectified that by changing mm -hmm. sentence, so-and-so. It's highlighted in this and this color in the manuscript. You know, like make it super easy for them to find, organize it very well, refer to mm -hmm. it. And I would always answer everything. Um, only if you really can't do something, like if it really doesn't make sense what the review said, then then that then, was you know, an issue. There the was editor. something here. Like, like, there's a bug. <laughs> you know, it, exactly. This is not like this comment isn't relevant. I mean, in a polite way, and then you don't have to do something. But whenever you can do something, and sometimes, I mean, I don't know. Maybe this is my personal opinion. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. it, it depends on your publishing strategy in the end. If you just want to get pub, like, you know, if you're a PhD student, you just need to get this paper published now. You don't have time to send it somewhere else. Um, also, if you're PI, I mean, it, I mean, most of yeah. us don't like just time want to is get always stuff a constraint. Yeah. Rather. <laughs> yeah. So then I would say if they ask you to cite another study, even though you go like, oh, <laughs> is that really your paper <laughs> you're asking me to cite? You know, I have done this in the past myself. And I would just, I mean, I, up to you, you know, whatever, you know, with your values, if that's like, you know, aligned with that. But I would always, I always answer everything and mm -hmm, try mm -hmm. to, because it's an easy win for you in the end. I mean, um, If they want you to publish something, uh, cite something, okay, just cite that paper. Otherwise, you kind of have to say why you don't want to cite it. I mean, it's also fine, but do then give your mm -hmm. reasons for why you really don't want to cite that paper. And that's then fine as well. No, but it, it's interesting, um, again, that yeah. that here that, that you need to think about the human you're actually interacting with and, and uh, when thinking of what, what response you need to give. And if you if you go too academic or ex expert, it, it won't be the right thing to do because the person you're actually talking with is not an expert. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I love it, Anna. Uh, sadly, the time the time mm -hmm. has kind of uh, is kind of over. We're almost at, at one hour of talking here, which was super pleasant. I I I kind of want to sum up some of the things that um that I um that I took and. The the one uh, that I'll, I'll reiterate it is this uh, question of the editor, the general editor. You needing as a re as a researcher to consider the person and who they are, the domain they uh, they uh, uh, the domains that they cover when communicating with them, but also being clear that at different stages of the process you are, although you may you might think, oh, I'm communicating with the magazine or with the journal, you're actually communicating with this human and that's important in the message that you bring this is something that i had never heard you know anyone talk about and that i think is, is an important take home from from today's conversation the second thing of course is uh storytelling i really liked uh, and it stuck to my mind this thing of again for the editor having them being able to if the, if they only look at the figure the eye of their mind the story that you're trying to tell and then of course accompanied by a cover letter that is not just a copy of the abstract and that kind of 
improves or, or or brings something more to that conversation and also that makes you human because it's not the fact of being of them being human but you're also a human who wants to to get their message through i really like that and um and then of course being robust in your data of course for the review part is important but being um uh the, the third one and last one that i want to reiterate because a lot of people out there who are doing PhDs, who are finishing PhDs, who are doing postdocs, changed countries to go do them. English or, you know, English, let's say, because it's the, the most, uh, the language that most people end up publishing in is not their first language. Don't worry about that. And I, I think, you know, Papa PhD is a lot of, a, a lot of the conversations I have end up being about inclusion. And, uh, and I do think that sometimes we end up excluding ourselves because we think we're not good enough. And please hear what Anna shared. Go back and re-listen. You know, you've got to the PhD, you've got to, to the stage you're at in your young researcher career. You you can do this. You can communicate your science. Don't sweat uh, the, the details too much in terms of grammar and style. You know, robust science, good communication. Of course, have have your things read by other people that that you respect and that you that you will uh, uh, be ready to take feed, feedback from, but don't sweat it too much and don't don't block yourselves from going towards this or that uh, publication because you're not a native speaker. Uh, that that would be the three take home messages. I don't know Anna if you if you like or agree with them. If and if you have a last word, but I really want to thank you for for having been here and having talk this hour with me on something that I hadn't covered yet and that, that was really, really interesting to me. Yeah, thank you so much. I love your uh, take-home, key take-away messages uh, that you have there. Um, and maybe just to add one thing to the non-native speaker conversation is that you know, I think I get approached equally mm. by native and non-native English speakers. And I think this is something that non-native speakers don't realize is that English native speakers also struggle with writing papers. Um, that Because it is about so much more. And just because you had English in school or you've wrote, I don't know, mm. essays in English, it doesn't mean that you know how to write a paper. Um, again, a quote I really like is, um, <laughs> academic English is nobody's first I language. Love it. It's by Ken Highland. He's a linguist. I love yeah, exactly. I love it too. It's like yeah, exactly. Like we all like we all have to learn this. We all have to learn how to write a good paper. <laughs> um, nobody was born <laughs> with that magic <laughs> skill, um, or nobody has learned that in high school or something. You know, like um, it's yeah, just it's a great you know another piece of encouragement. Thank you. And it's a and great I love to finish. I love the quote: "Academic academic English." is not anyone's first language. I love it. I really love it. <laughs> uh, all right, Anna, this was great. Again, if uh, you want to go and uh, and register for Anna's uh, free training, again, the link that I uh, set up that's going to point to her page is papaphd.com forward slash Anna Clemens. Um, thanks to everyone who watched live. Uh, it's really appreciated. Um, if you don't follow Papa PhD uh, on YouTube, please do. Uh, we're just a little bit over 300, and I know that I think if you get to 500, there's some new things that I can do for for the community, and then of course a thousand. But that's that's going to be later on. Um, these days, I'm trying to get to know viewers and listeners better. So if you have a few minutes, and uh, if you go to papaphd.com forward slash audience, there's a short survey there that will allow me to better serve you, uh, serve the community in the future, uh, because I'll get to know who is listening and who is watching a little bit better. So if you can go there, uh, it would be great. If uh, you want to support Papa PhD, uh, it, it's, uh, there's two ways to do it. You can go again to papaphd.com forward slash support and, uh, and uh, give a donation, I think, through PayPal. Uh, and then if you are on Patreon you have, and, and it's, you know, it's something that you do, Papa PhD is on Patreon. You can also become a patron. It'll be really appreciated and it'll help me keep on bringing these great, great conversations week uh, after week. So, uh, so that's it. Thanks to everyone who watched live. Thank you if you're watching uh, later on. And uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll uh, 
close the feed now say thank you again to anna and say uh, meet you in the next uh, in in a future week for another papa pc conversation thanks anna this was great thank you <laughs> bye